to Live with Lewis for July 22nd, 2004. Hello, I'm Tim Gore, enrichment teacher for the School District of Clayton, Missouri, and part of your Lewis and Clark Then and Now education team, and I'm happy to welcome you to today's webcast. Today's webcast is a bit unique for us, and you may notice a little bit of difference as a result because we're coming to you from three different locations. I'm here in St. Louis, Missouri. Scott Mandrell, who portrays Meriwether Lewis for the Discovery Expedition, is actually out in Montana today doing some National Guard business. He'll be joining us in a minute. And of course, our technical director, Jim Sturm, is on the trail in Nebraska City with the rest of our guests. We look forward to the opportunity to connecting to all three of those places, and of course, to connecting with you as you send us your email questions. Our email address is lewisandclark at clayton.k12.mo.us. So be sure to send us questions that deal with today's topic. Nebraska City, where Jim Sturm and our guests find themselves, is of course where the Discovery Expedition of St. Charles will be arriving today as part of their real-time reenactment. And interestingly enough, in the same year that the nation commemorates the 200th anniversary of the Lewis and Clark Expedition, Nebraska City is commemorating its sesquicentennial, its 150th anniversary. Nebraska City is also the location where Arbor Day was, Arbor Day was founded by J. Sterling Morton. Arbor Day, of course, is a national holiday as well as a foundation now, which is dedicated to planting trees and preserving nature. And we're using that idea as the stepping stone for today's feature focus as we learn about Nebraska habitat, both in terms of plant life and animal life from guests from the River Country Nature Center, which is located in Nebraska City. You're also going to have the chance today to meet the director of the brand new Lewis and Clark Center, which is open in Nebraska City. So please send us your email questions to lewisandclark at clayton.k12.mo.us. And I'm very happy now to send us out to Montana and Scott Mandrell. Hello, Scott. Hi, Tim. How are you doing? Good, thanks. Good, thanks, everyone. Thank you, everyone, for joining us today. Today, as Tim mentioned, is a unique broadcast because of the three locations we're going to be coming to you from today. As Tim mentioned, uh, I've uh, left the trail for a couple of days, and are, we're looking forward as we're making some plans for, for next year as we move into Montana. And uh, we're still going to, to follow our normal, our, our normal uh, agenda the way we normally do. We're going to start this week by taking a look back at what happened 200 years ago and a historical perspective on what happened during the expedition 200 years ago. And uh, one of the things that happened most specifically 200 years ago was that the expedition moved toward the mouth of the Platte River. Now that was a, an extraordinary moment for them because the Platte River was a defining tributary of the Missouri River. And as we look over the journals, it's interesting that we understand that uh, Lewis and Clark spend a great deal of time describing how the Platte River impacts the Missouri River. Now, as the Corps has moved today up toward Nebraska City, they have not made it quite to the mouth of the Platte, and we'll be doing that in the next few days. But it's interesting, as we look at the original journals, how concerned Clark and Lewis are with the terrain features. Clark has begun to describe the bald pate, uh, bald pate prairies, as he refers to them, the, the row of uh, prairies that sort of take the, the full brunt of the western winds coming off of the Great Plains, which he encounters right at what is today the uh, Iowa, Nebraska, Missouri border, where those states come together there, and Kansas, where the, the four corners of those four states. He also describes in detail the, the rich, low hills that are there and the drought-resistant uh, fauna that grows on those hills. He describes the large ore deposits. And particularly, as they approach the mouth, he starts to describe the nature of the river and how it changes with the great number of sandbars and, and all that are formed below the mouth of the Platte River. And it's also interesting that he starts to describe, uh, an, he's starting to see fauna and flora that are changing dramatically, <clears throat> excuse me, from what he's seen to that point. In fact, he remarks on the 20th of July that he's actually killed a large yellow wolf. Now, that species of wolf is actually extinct today, but fortunately, un because of, of the journals, because of Clark's entries and other things, like many other animals, in addition to those that were documented by the expedition that are, are still uh, known to us today, there are a number of animals that are now extinct that we still have some clues about those species thanks to the original expedition. Lewis also spends a great deal of time at this point talking about uh, celestial observations. They've entered, essentially, again, a, a new phase in the expedition. They have left the hills and, the, and the, the high hills that have accompanied the Missouri River, and they're starting to reach the open plains, much as we have been doing over the last week or so as well. And with the open sky means much better celestial observations and the ability for them to do uh, actually more 
more specific cartography, they're able to take better readings with, the, with those open skies. The night sky is much clearer to them, unobstructed, and that sort of thing. As uh, we mentioned briefly last week when we came to you from Brownville, uh, excuse me, Brownville, Nebraska, um, we, that day, the 15th, when we broadcast you, uh, interestingly enough, one of the journal entries that day was the fact that Lewis's chronometer had stopped working, and he had to reset his chronometer, and so he called that a second point of departure. And in many ways, from a terrain feature perspective, it was. They were entering truly the Great Plains, and everything was about to change for the original expedition. So as we look at what's happened with us in the last week, we came to you last week from the Captain Meriwether Lewis Steamboat Museum there in Brownville, Nebraska. We had an opportunity to spend uh, a great deal of time in that community taking a look at the different uh, museums and sites of historical interest in that community as we, uh, as we were there for several days and participated in some special events in that area. And then we left there and made our way up to the mouth of the Niobrara and spent several days at a wilderness camp up the Niobrara. And of course, Clark describes in detail uh, Lewis is leaving the camp and making his way up the Niobrara to investigate it further as well. And they start to see a change again here because of the flat elevation and indeed the word plat the, 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 that the Platte River takes its name from is actually the French word for flat. And he, Lewis and Clark both start to describe the fact that the, river does, the rivers there don't rise the way that they have seen rivers rising past. The cut banks are not as high and that sort of thing. And in fact, the word Nebraska it comes from an Indian word, and it, it, it actually means flat also, or flat place. So we're starting to see, uh, we're starting to see um, the name places are changing. Many of the places to this point have been taking their names from the French voyageurs and, and, uh, and trappers who had given them names. Now even the French who had been influenced by the natives in that area are starting to take the name places of, of the Native Americans. In fact, as we approach the city of Omaha today, Clark in his journals has indicated that He's afraid that uh, the Pawnee, the Oto, and the other Native Americans who have villages in that area, he knows that they're out uh, on the Great Plains hunting at that time, and he expresses uh, regret that they are probably not going to have the opportunity to encounter those tribes. And indeed, it's important again to remember as part of this diplomatic mission being conducted by this the, by this army expedition, part of their charge was to make contact with the Native Americans, and uh, they indeed had prepackaged presents and, and uh, uh, ceremonial trade goods and that sort of thing that they had intended to trade with the Pawnee and the Oto, who once they got there were not there. They also described in the original expedition that there were prairie fires, and they saw evidence of prairie fires and that sort of thing. And of course today, uh, while that's an agricultural area, rather than what the Indians were, were burning the prairie for other purposes, for grazing lands and that sort of thing, to invite the buffalo, and that um, today that's mostly an agricultural area, and we've been witnesses of that. We've been very fortunate to enjoy the good offices of uh, men such as uh, James Oatman and Ed Murray and some of the farmers that uh, live along the Niobrara who have provided us with, uh, with uh, private campsites and that sort of thing so that we can take a little respite before we move into the Omaha area. I think we're going to take a look at some footage now from what's happened over the last week. So, Jim, if you could roll that now. Now here we are, you see the uh, keelboat making its way out of Brownville. We had some weather there, uh, both rain and heat. Uh, the rain, of course, uh, is one of the reasons we tent the boat, but the heat as well. Uh, when, uh, the other day when we left there uh, to make our way up here to Montana, it was 106 degrees with 98% humidity. So I assure you that the tenting on the boat has, uh, has as much uh, impact on the men and their well-being during the warm weather as well as during the inclement weather with gray and that sort of thing. And here's a very uh, unique shot. Not very many people get to see this, but this is like the keel boat um, underneath the tenting there. Here we are by an excursion boat. This is the Spirit of Brownville. As we uh, get into the Brownville area, there's an excursion boat that this small community has. This is a community of 143 persons, and they have only 20 national in the community, so it's quite spectacular. And there you see the cannon being discharged on the bow of the hill as a salute. The ground is fired as the spirit of Brownville passes by. And that was a Real treat for the folks there. Again, uh, unique, uh, some unique footage here. Jim Skirmar, it, Skipper. Let's go. 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 Let's go.
keep her out of the extremely swift current. Clark and Lewis both, in, as a matter of fact, this week, 200 years ago, they, they talk about the current, the swift current here. Um, they talk about it running somewhere between 6 and 7 miles an hour. We were fighting currents between 8 and 10 miles an hour. And we've talked about that before during these broadcasts, about the high velocity of the current in this area and, and why it's uh, so difficult to navigate the, these rivers today because of, of that deep channel and swift and here we are, once again, leaving Brownville. And there you see from an elevated position there the Missouri River as it looks today, much more constrained than it was 200 years ago when Lewis Clark and the Corps of Discovery passed by there. And you'll see on the right-hand side, if you see those, those lines jutting out into the river, those are wing dikes. And the river today is constrained by wing dikes, which make its, uh, which make its channel very deep and its current very, very swift. Of course, 200 years ago, you would have seen water spread out uh, much wider across this floodplain than you see here today. Here's some, uh, some additional footage of the boats moving on the water. And uh, again, we're at uh, approximately 600 miles now up the Missouri River. And uh, it's, it's about three to four miles an hour is our average speed. And here we are at our, uh, one of our wilderness camps. And the men are taking the time to do some repairs. To their, to their accoutrement and weapons, and also take the time to get in some target practice and some live fire uh, opportunities, which we don't get very often in the, in the urban and populated areas. Um, as you see, what's happening there is the gentleman's loading his flintlock rifle. And uh, you can tell right away that that's a rifle by the, how hard he had to get that round in there. If that was a smooth bore musket, he would have had, uh, he, that ball would have went in the chamber much more easily, but in the rifled weapon, it's very tight. And here he is priming the pan. And of course, there he closes the frizzen, which is the steel piece that the flint will strike to make the spark. And there you have it. Uh, rifle's eye view of discharging the weapon and he's blowing the smoke out to make sure that the chamber is clear. And here's uh, Jim Gassner. He's a cooper that travels with us and he's working there on, uh, looks like he's working on some, perhaps some willow to make some willow baskets or, or uh, one of his buckets. So important to the Discovery Expedition is to try to tell the, the story of, of life for these men uh, throughout the course of their expedition and also the types of skills that the men who were on the original Corps brought to the expedition. Again, uh, this, was, this was more than simply a group of soldiers. It was a group of very talented uh, individuals who brought many assets uh, to the expedition, including their, their skills that they would have had from back home in Pennsylvania or Virginia. And here he is making a stave bucket. And uh, Jim's uh, been with us for several years. He's traveled on the Columbia with us and on the Upper Missouri when we moved on that uh, a few years ago. And uh, Jim's business is actually making uh, coopered wares, and you can visit his website at uh, beaverbuckets.com. We'll go back to you, Tim, now. Are you uh, ready to introduce our guest for today? I believe Nancy Houck is oh. there, and we want to welcome her and thank her for all of the, the work that she's done in Nebraska to bring the bicentennial commemoration to life there. She is indeed there. That's wonderful. Um, glad to see you again. Hope everything's working out well for you in Montana. Let's go to Nebraska City and let's welcome Nancy to our webcast, the director of the new Lewis and Clark Center there. Hello, Nancy. Hello, Scott. It's such a pleasure and exciting to have you here. We are hoping that out of this big window behind us, you'll be able to see those boats come up the river. Uh, in the interim, we'd like to talk a little bit about our center and the things that are happening. Uh, deadlines are a wonderful thing, and we're working now to have our grand opening on the 30th of July. Uh, our center is, as you may know, unique in the country. We have our center focused on the flora and fauna and scientific discoveries uh, made by Lewis and Clark at the direction of President Thomas Jefferson. So we are going to uh, have a little tour in a minute uh, of the things that are here, but I thought I'd give you some background on the, a little about the center. We're located on a beautiful scenic site. You can see the woods behind me with an awesome view of the Missouri River. 
and we have 80 acres uh, in the bluffs. Actually, our path, our walk to the river, has a 189-foot drop. So it, you don't want to fall off there. We're going to have a great observation deck. But the whole grounds will eventually be interpreted with trails. Uh, should be a fun uh, adventure. But interactive and observation and discovery, which is really what Thomas Jefferson was telling Lewis and Clark to do, uh, that will be the basis of our center. As you'll see, there are many things to look at. You can take a treasure hunt to find all the plants and animals of Lewis and Clark somewhere uh, in this center. We are looking forward, as I said, to opening our doors officially. We have a grand opening celebration that will be July 30th. We have an all-day festivities with tremendous speakers, Dayton Duncan, James Ronda, Gary Moulton, Hal Stearns, Jane Gunderson, uh, Gerard Baker, uh, our new uh, regional manager for the Park Service, Ernie Quintana. So we have we even have a, quite a few Newfoundlands, so you can have a, all kinds of experiences here. But we welcome you to Nebraska City. We hope we're going to be able to see that boat come up the river, but we're glad to have you be able to see our great center. It's about 12,000 square foot on three levels and um, is a kind of self-guided intended uh, place for a tour. As you come in, you'll receive a map and then you'll be able to uh, interact with all these exhibits. We were very fortunate to be able to hire Split Rock Studios of St. Paul who have installed three 18-wheelers full of fantastic exhibits. And they're here. Uh, we're going to um, be able to go through some of those today. So maybe we'd like, would you like to roll a little film, Jim? You are seeing our sculptor, Tom Palmerton, who is from Brownville, uh, where they last stopped. Tom Palmerton has done this sculpture, and he's our local, or we feel he's ours, and he's done a beautiful job. It greets you as you come off the highway. This keel boat, which is kind of the theme of the exploration, um, is going to be located as an outdoor exhibit just as you come in uh, from uh, up the sidewalk. So it is the keel boat that was from the IMAX production. It's great. You're uh, looking now at a mural in the background and the entrance as you come into the center. We're just, as you can see, getting installed. We have a lovely gift shop with lots of very interesting things. Our elevator is nearing completion. Today's supposed to be that day. Uh, Paco Young from Montana did this wonderful grizzly bear. He has a painting over the fireplace um, at the lodge in Yellowstone. You can see that upstairs, as you come up the stairs, this is called our walk through the wild. We have the Missouri River Basin with buffalo um, who will uh, really stop you. He's beautiful and uh, is located in an area with many things. This then is the mural um, that's on the first level and what this really shows is how people got off their boats uh, and came to Nebraska City and we're located here largely because we were a very gentle incline from the river. Uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful mural that portrays Lewis and Clark going by noting the dog that they assumed was an Indian dog, so there must be some Indians in the area, and it shows the lay of the land. Also, it shows the skags in the, uh, snags in the river, and um, that was a very serious issue for them, so it's nice to portray that. 
And Nebraska City is located as uh, a very important river connection uh, right uh, from as a, up off the bluffs. We don't flood because we are on the bluffs, but uh, it's, a, it's a beautiful community, one of the most historic in Nebraska. Uh, this shows the theme. Uh, one of the interesting exhibits allows you to uh, try to do dead reckoning. It does do a GPS to check you, which I would need. But it teaches you by looking out the window. It gives you a sense of how Lewis and Clark really actually did dead reckoning and how impressive it is that out of a 4,100-mile trip, they were able to come, some have said, within 40 miles. So they really um, had a challenge, and you get to have that challenge as well. I, I have a friend that says we'll have to teach math off of this. I think this will be one of the really fun ways to teach math. We have the pierogue from the IMAX located on the first floor, and that will be interactive as well. You see here moving the oars. Uh, it's a rowing interactive to give you a sense of what it took to pull this pierogue off of the sandbar that it's located on. And in the front of the sandbar, um, you see some Missouri River fish and um, how it was in its setting. Up on the, uh, sitting on the bow is a wonderful rendition of semen. And uh, uh, next to the boat, we'll have um, this barrel will show that it, there, it's described in the journals that they put choke cherries into the, their whiskey. So that will be a fun too, because that happened here. This wonderful bear does really get your attention when you come in. He's a great deal taller than I am and, and most. Um, these indicate the kind of plants and animal cards that we have in naturalist bins. There are 15 of them around. In this one, you put them in and scan uh, whatever card you're interested in. You'll see the eagle feather on the top of the card. In each exhibit, there is an eagle favor, feather which um, portrays the impact of the Native Americans, which was so big. This shows the bones that they sent back on a badger, and it's a whole study of what a badger, how they were written about and recorded. And what I found out recently is they ate those, and they only sent a bag of bones back, which makes you really impressed by the fact that they could draw pictures of things uh, of which they only had bones to pull together. This is a puzzle of the badger. And of course, uh, be, being the plants and animals, we have uh, flower presses and, and presses for the herbal things that they picked up. And that will, the, in fact, we'll have uh, instruction in that uh, for young people. Education is our whole basis. These are reading rails that make part of the interactive. Just so many things uh, that you can learn. Here you take a whiff of nutmeg and other uh, things we might think of as spices, but really were herbal, uh, medicinal rather, for Lewis and Clark. It makes you feel pretty good that you didn't have to rely on the medicine of the time uh, when you take a trip. This, of course, is Dr. Benjamin Russia's medicine chest, and um, it's quite wonderful. You can push a button, and it'll tell you what each of the things are and uh, give you a chance to make up your mind uh, about how you might treat some of the things that uh, face Lewis and Clark. That's an amputee saw that I don't find too attractive, <laughs> but I'm sure they needed those kinds of things. Here is the bane of the existence of Lewis and Clark on the Missouri River. This is a monstrous sized mosquito. We're going to be sure that he doesn't get away, so he's in a loose sight cage. But you can put your hand into this tube and feel the movement of, of the mosquitoes, and you hear that buds that drives us all crazy. We're going down, down to the prairie dog town, and this is great fun for kids. You can see there are critters in the halls, and the children can actually get down and crawl through and gives you a sense that... Uh, must have been just a little 
a little scary. We also have a um, sensor uh, that has a raptor fly over and the prairie dogs talk to you. This is to trying to pour enough water in, uh, into this hole and get the prairie dog out. Of course, they never do, but it's, it's fun. And everyone tries and tries, as Lewis Clark and his men did, to see if they can't drown that prairie dog out. This is a wolf that you'll find is looking right into the eyes of the buffalo I mentioned. And um, here is this very good sized fella. Uh, he's sitting in a setting where he might have been uh, near a prairie dog uh, town, near old Baldy. And he's, uh, you can almost feel him. This is a, a buffalo pie, and these kids I'm sure will love. But this is what they burned as fuel, and this is a way of showing people how much that's changed. There's a scapula there um, and many things about that area. This little black bear came to us from Wyoming, has a lot of personality, and you see him looking up in the tree. We intend to have honey up there for it. But uh, he again has the reading rail, and here is the reading rail with the scapula, which shows how they use that tool that was from the shoulder of a buffalo. Um, but this is a good example. There's the eagle feather noting the impact of the Native Americans. Uh, is a good example of the kind of activity. This is our wonderful grizzly bear. He came from Williston, North Dakota. And he appears behind a scrim curtain. And I think it's going to growl for you um, eventually. But he's just delightful. This map uh, was created to sh have a tactile uh, feeling kind of map of the trail. We have the sc state school for the visually impaired and blind here, and we found about the, this artist. And the woods in this came from the bottom of Lake Superior. And they're really historic woods, and they're carved off of directions from a satellite, so they're quite accurate. They go to Mount Hood on this end, and there's a legend that shows what the different mean, woods mean. So it's, it's wonderful and something very touchable uh, and to discover and observe. Hi, Nancy. This is Nancy. Tim Gore from St. Louis. Uh, thanks so much for that tour. What a fantastic facility you've got there. Uh, when's your, how exciting is it to finally be able to open it after all this time of putting it together? It's very exciting, Tim. And as you mo may know, I started this project with Congressman Doug B. Ryder, who's been so active in Lewis and Clark. And he came to me in 87. So either this is a complicated project or I'm a slow worker. <laughs> but we're thrilled to be finally <laughs> opening the doors. And it is a spectacular setting. You, you need to come see it. Well, I look forward to it. I'm going to be up in the Omaha area next week, so maybe I, maybe I can come by Nebraska City either on my way to Omaha or from Omaha so I can get a chance to see it. And, of course, we're happy to invite everybody else who's watching the webcast to come to Nebraska City, too. You bet. We'll not only have the grand opening, but we'll be here forever. But we'd like to give you a special invitation, Tim, for a red carpet tour. So you call, and we'll, we'll make it available for you. Well, thank you very much, Nancy, for joining us today. The facility looks absolutely phenomenal. Scott, I'll go to you out in Montana. Do you have any questions you'd like to ask Nancy? Well, thanks, Tim. I did want to ask, uh, I know that the, the center took a little bit of a turn. It started out as a, a much smaller facility, and I was just going to ask Nancy about how, uh, how the decision was made or, or what was the impetus to grow, grow the decision, or grow, grow the uh, the facility size. I know it, it's almost tripled in size, I believe, and I just, if you could just share with us a little bit about uh, the support that they received on that and how that happened. Yes, I'd be pleased to talk about that. Of course, it's like so many things, it took money. And we made a decision when we got a really great architect from the National Park Service, Pat Pauley, and he, we talked about him about the flora and fauna and the river, 
And so he conceived of this W-shaped building. And one wing behind me looks out directly on the river view. The other one looks out on the prairie and the prairie grasses and the wildflowers. So those will be kind of our themes. And as our expectations grew, we had to grow the building, which, of course, meant we had to raise money. We have a public-private partnership. The National Park Service has done a turnkey, which by legislation they need to walk away, and they will turn it over to our foundation. So we feel fortunate for having a great association with the Park Service. And also, we, we have now passed six and a half million. We will have raised as a foundation 90% of the money. And it takes money, but we are thrilled to have the partnership. And it, this wouldn't be possible except for a lot of great partners, including the National Park Service. Tim, if I may, very quickly. I just wanted to tell Nancy how much we've enjoyed the, uh, the time we've spent in Nebraska. From the time we entered Nebraska uh, with Indian Cave State Park, uh, Nebraska has been a surprise for many of us who hadn't spent a great deal of time there. And for our viewing audience and uh, those who are going to be traveling the trail, uh, I would really encourage them to not overlook Nebraska. We have found Nebraska to be a, a sort of hidden treasure. So we really want to encourage people to take the time to explore uh, what we've had the opportunity to enjoy all along this, this last week or so that we've had the opportunity to spend time in that great state. Thank you, Scott, for the promo. It's, it's wonderful, and we have really easy access here. We are just about three miles from I-29. We have a, an expressway that goes directly um, to I-80. So it's easy to find us. So we look forward to welcoming you. Well, thanks very much, Nancy. Thanks so much for joining us. We're really pleased to be able to give the, uh, the center a look to everybody who's watching on our webcast today, and of course, everybody who'll be watching it on the archive as well. And that information and the visuals you saw give you a really good indication of the variety of exhibits that are obviously located there at the Lewis and Clark Center in Nebraska City. A lot of those exhibits deal with the flora and fun of the animal and plant life of that area of Nebraska. And our next guests who are going to be joining us in Nebraska City are from the River Country Nature Center. And they're going to give us a little bit more information about Nebraska plant and animal life and we're going to have the opportunity to welcome them to the webcast here in, in just a minute and we're and I would echo Scott Mandrell's comments about the beauty the unexpected beauty in some people's estimation perhaps of the Nebraska region Nebraska has a lot of diverse habitat areas and we're happy now to be able to learn more about them so I'm going to go back to Nebraska City where I see we've been joined by our two guests there and gentlemen if you'll introduce yourselves please we'll take it from there with a few questions afterwards Great. I am Brian Volkmer, and I am the acting director of the River Country Nature Center. And with me is Dr. Larry Falk, one of the board members and one of our uh, ornithologist experts that works with the uh, River Country Nature Center. Well, thanks so much for joining us. I'll start with just a question about what is the River Country Nature Center? What's your mission? Uh, what would one see when one gets to go there? Well, the River Country Nature Center was started in 1975, and this is actually the, uh, the work of one man. Uh, Joe Vogus has been a taxidermist since 1933 and has a very, very large collection of primarily Nebraska specimens. Uh, the Nature Center was started to really teach about the wildlife of Nebraska City as our Nebraska and uh, also teach the uh, environmental stewardship. Uh, so that really is our mission. Uh, we are in the process of moving to a new location. We probably about two months before we'll be open to the public, uh, but it will, the location is much improved, and uh, more importantly, we have access to everybody. Uh, it'll increase the exhibit space as well as our uh, research and educational opportunities we offer. Well, let's take a minute a little bit and talk about that area of the state where you are, southeastern Nebraska. If one is to go into southeastern Nebraska and begin to explore the territory, what kinds of plant and animal life would one see there? How would one describe the environment in that location? Uh, <clears throat> I have a diagram here. I don't, don't know if you can see it from there. But, uh, of course, we're located right along the Missouri 
river here and this is mostly the eastern deciduous area and the, uh, the purple area that shows up marks that. I want to point out that the, uh, the map I have here is before European settlement and so it's, uh, it indicates what the territory was like before the, the Europeans came here. The uh, adjacent area uh, to the river is uh, the old long uh, grass prairie. But of course the long grass prairie has pretty well dissipated by now. It's uh, been plowed under. And then uh, adjacent to that, we come to the mixed prairie and then to the west, the far west part of Nebraska, we have uh, the short grass prairie and uh, to the, of course, the light area that you see just showing here uh, is the sand hills. And of course, that is a very unique area and an extensive area uh, of the state of Nebraska. Uh, as, to, as to the area that we're in here, the uh, trees that you would find here are pretty largely the, uh, the kind of trees that that were always here, uh, such as the oak, of course, and the hickory, and uh, uh, cottonwood, and box elder, uh, those kinds of trees. And as you would suspect, you will find uh, the same kind of uh, birds and animals uh, that have been here for a long time. I might point up, though, that a couple of the birds uh, seen by Lewis and Clark are no longer here. This is the uh, uh, passenger pigeon, which uh, of course you know is uh, extinct and, and many people know about passenger pigeon. But there is uh, another species that was also in this area and this is the Carolina parakeet and Lewis and Clark made mention of these and we had every reason to believe that they were in this area when Lewis and Clark came here. Uh, so we're, we're, missing, we're missing those species. That's one of the things Thanks. that the uh, River very much, Nature Ryan. does. Ryan, you uh, want to add something? Uh, if I could. Uh, the, the Missouri River Basin Lewis and Clark really looks at the flora and fauna discovered on the entire expedition, but what the River Country Nature Center does is really takes kind of a microscopic view of one section of the country and really explores that a little bit more, uh, where we look at the uh, different environment ecosystems in Nebraska, and especially along this area, and uh, through exhibits and edu educational activities really kind of focus in on what was here when they were through and what's here now. Well, as we look at that topic, I think one of the things that's always interesting to our viewers is some differences between the ecosystem at the time of the exposition, expedition and the ecosystem today. What are some of those factors? What are some similarities uh, in the region today that Lewis and Clark might have noticed? And what are some striking differences that would be true of habitat there today? Well, we do, we do have a description that uh, Clark made here on July 19th, uh, 1804. And so we have a pretty good idea what Table uh, Creek area. Table Creek is north and south, and uh, it runs right through Nebraska City. And so that may not have changed all that much. It was one of the places that did have uh, a good deal of uh, vegetation trees growing along it. But uh, even as Lewis and Clark indicated on their way back, the Missouri River had changed considerably. Uh, between 1804 and their return in 1806. And so uh, the 200 years since then has brought even more change. Uh, probably our viewers are aware of the controversy uh, that's going on over uh, the use of the Missouri River and what needs to be done uh, with the oxbows and uh, how high uh, uh, the levels ought to be maintained, etc. But as to the species using uh, the migration uh, area along the river, that may not have changed all that much, although some of the uh, larger species have, have passed out of the area. Um, 
uh, such as the uh, grouse. And so uh, that may not have changed. Uh, Lewis remarked that the Platte River was too muddy to drink. That hasn't changed much. Uh, although the controversy continues, uh, also I'm sure most of the viewers are aware of the Sandhill Cranes that use the Platte River extensively and arguments going on about how that ought to be changed or not. Uh, obviously the Platte River has changed considerably. It has a good deal more vegetation uh, growing along it and so that continues to be a controversy. In fact, all of the streams in Nebraska have, have come under controversy. Uh, the Niobrara to the north, Republican uh, to the south, and all the other small creeks uh, which have uh, dams along them trying to control uh, the runoff, et cetera. Thanks very much. That's wonderful. I want to I want to spend a little bit of time about the one of the unique regions that exists in Nebraska, and that's the Sandhills region. I think that would really surprise some people to learn that that ex area exists out there. Could you explain to people what formed the Sandhills? What are we talking about out there in that region of the country? We're talking about uh, essentially stabilized sand dunes. And a few years ago, the National Geographic carried a very interesting article about uh, the sand hills and the concerns that uh, persons have as to how many years of drought it would take uh, to make the more or less stable sand hills uh, unstable sand dunes again. Uh, essentially, it's sand piles with uh, grass growing on top of it and uh, ponds uh, growing, uh, uh, accumulating water. Uh, the table, uh, the water table is fairly high in some places, but uh, taking uh, a test right now these years. So uh, essentially that's what it is, a very low populated area. Uh, some of the pioneers tried to uh, uh, make some uh, farming uh, out of the region with, uh, with little success. Uh, most people agree now this area should not be cultivated uh, that's that's the most that uh, uh, the most that needs to be done is simply a uh, used for for cattle. And Tim, uh, just to add on to that, there is one other unique uh, geographical feature that a lot of people don't know about, and that is the hills that we're on right now. And those are the Los Hills. Uh, these are the windblown hills that are created over time from wind coming up and creating the bluff. The only other place that this type of geographical uh, uh, topography occurs is in China, which is most people don't really know. But so we do have some very unique, even though it's known as flat land, we have some very unique geographical uh, uh, and topographical uh, sites in the state. Thank you. I'm going to go to Scott to see if Scott has any question he'd like to ask right now of the two of you. Thanks, Tim. Yes, I think uh, since we're dealing with folks who are so familiar with the ornithology, it made me wonder if maybe they could share just some basic information for our viewers. Um, what is the state bird? What is the state uh, tree and plant? Uh, for, our, for Particularly for our young viewers who are uh, maybe studying about Nebraska, could you share some of those, uh, those, uh, those sort of easy answers for us? Uh, when, we come to, when we come to Nebraska, uh, what, what should we look for to recognize as the state bird and that sort of thing, state tree? And also, I guess one of the, the questions is, if there was one thing, if I'm coming to Nebraska, uh, that I should look for that I can't see anywhere else with regard to flora and fauna, what would it be? Well, uh, we've, we've talked about the, the large areas, but uh, the state uh, bird is the, uh, the western meadowlark. And as a matter of fact, you can hear both the eastern and western meadowlark in the same field out here in the local golf course. Uh, the state tree is the cottonwood. And uh, it's a very important tree because it marked the trail very, very large cottonwoods were growing along the way. As to uh, what to look for, uh, the, the species of birds that we have are uh, not all that unique. They're, they're the ones that are found either in migration. But I might point up that one winter uh, visitor here is the Harris Sparrow. It nests up in the tundra. And this is a good place to find it down here uh, during the winter. In fact, it spends about seven months down here. It's here uh, a lot longer than it is up in the nesting uh, tundra area. 
I'm going to take this opportunity to go to, to Jim and the folks in Nebraska City and find out if there's any email questions, Jim, that you may have all received at this point in time that you'd like to ask. If so, um, we'd like to ask them of our guests. And of course, if it's an email question that applies to Nancy or to Scott, we'll be happy to do that as well. So Jim, do we have some email questions today? Uh, we have one internet question. Uh, that is, uh, what type of cottonwood trees would we find along the Missouri and Niobrara rivers in Nebraska? Uh, and is the prolonged drought and river control issues having an effect on the cottonwood population along the river there? We're primarily with the eastern cottonwood here, but of course as you go west you'll find uh, other species. Cottonwood trees are exceedingly hardy in dry years. I happened to grow up in Nebraska on a farm that had cottonwood trees during the high drought areas and I can say that uh, they do very well in drought areas and they can tolerate a fair amount of water as well. So uh, I don't think we need to worry about their surviving. Thanks very much. Um, Brian and Larry, I want to thank you very much for joining us. Before I sign off to you guys, I want to go back out to Scott to see if he might have any other question he'd like to ask. Uh, no, no other questions at this time. We want to certainly thank the folks of Nebraska. We've, we've already had a great week or so moving into Nebraska. We look forward to the, the next month, really, that we'll be passing through, uh, at least on one side of the river, uh, and spending time with those folks as we make our way north along the river. And uh, really want to encourage folks to join us next week, and of course, uh, all of the things that will have taken place on our expedition as we pass through this very uh, sort of uh, unknown, and uh, at least even today, somewhat unknown and exciting region of the country. So we look forward to seeing everyone next week. Thanks very much, Scott. Thank you, Brian. Thank you, Larry. Thank you, Nancy. In addition, next week, we're also going to pursue this river topic a little bit more. Uh, we're going to be joined by Paul Johnson from the U.S. Army Corps of Engineers, and we're going to have a chance to talk about some of those issues that are facing the rivers of our country today, specifically along the Missouri River. So to everybody, we want to say thanks so much for joining us with this week's webcast. And until we see you next week, we say, proceed on.